everyone welcome so this is the week before uh spring break um remember, uh you have one homework assignment due on uh wednesday right which is the um recommender system so remember for that one um i want you guys to not just submit it but demo it so we're going to take some time on wednesday you know towards the end of the class just to um go over um, you know, you'll demo all, you know, just basically how it works, and, and then we'll have a discussion. So it, it shouldn't be the whole class, but just a few minutes of it. Okay. All right. So uh, that so that's basically the discussion on the homework. Let me just make sure this is recording. All right. So today we just have one topic, or I should say. I'm introducing a new topic, and this topic is will just be covered this week. Okay. Um, so if you remember the way that I divided this course, kind of divided it into three areas. It's not necessarily that these are the only areas in machine learning. But I did divide it into these three areas, which are distance metric, uh, this distance metric approaches you know that have to do with dimensionality right so we talked about all that KNN singular value decomposition um, singular value decomposition etc and these are methods uh, that are you know I'm not really so a lot of people will divide things into like supervised and unsupervised learning right but I'm kind of dividing it in, in a different way into just you know methods that are distance metric, which are you know one simple way to think about this is the vector space model. So you really just think about the vector space model, right? Space, and this can be in multiple dimensions, Rn, and so on. And all data sets really can be formatted in a way that they can be represented as a vector space. So I want to stress that, right? Even the the probabilistic things when we look at those data sets, it's still iris, right? It's still mnist. We still, we applied uh, naive Bayes, for instance, to the iris data set. So the data set itself is in a vector space. But the, al the algorithms, the techniques that we use are a little bit different. So this, so this is kind of the first way that I divided the class. The second way that I divided the class the semester is, you know, probabilistic methods, right? Probabilistic. And this just means a probability, a likelihood, right? So, you know, what is the probability that today is going to be sunny? Well, probably not great, right? So just by looking at the, the weather, 0.3% chance. But how do we know that? We have this information collected from real experience. And then within this idea of probabilistic, we looked at Bayes' theorem, of course. theorem, which on, on, on which we built a lot of things because Bayes' theorem addresses conditional probability. So it gives us a way to estimate A given B, okay? So that's kind of where we were with that. Um, and so, uh, and then after, and then that led us into the algorithm naive base, right, which we looked at. Last week, we looked at hidden Markov models, so HMM, and we saw that those are similar, almost exactly the same idea as naive Bayes, but what's the new aspect of hidden Markov models? What's the new aspect? What's the new characteristic? 
this was sequential, right? Sequence, right? So sequence. And that's really important because we want to predict the weather for the next five days based on ice cream consumption. So you eat, you eat ice cream on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and not eat ice cream Thursday and Friday. So then you might say sunny, 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 you know, winter, 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 or rainy, rainy, rainy. Okay, so that's basically the idea, but the framework is exactly the same one. It's still probabilistic. And as you saw, Naive Bayes builds really well on top of, um, or HMMs actually, follows really well after Naive Bayes. And that's kind of why I, over the years, have put them together, right? So even though other people would divide them in a different way, right? And then after that, given that I'm kind of on this sequence, this is sequential, which means that a decision uh, that we're going to make on Wednesday depends on decisions Tuesday and Monday, right? It's, there's a sequence there. It's, you know, conditional in a sense. So then that's where, that's why, kind of, I add this net, the topic for this week here, reinforcement learning. Okay, but reinforcement learning, other people divide it. Other people will say, well, machine learning is really divided into supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. Sure, why not? Okay, um, my way of, of organizing these things, it's really because of how, you know, this idea of probabilistic, right? Although we're not using Bayes' theorem, we are going to calculate a type of a probability. All right, and so um, it's, it's called actually a reward, not a probability, but it's a similar idea. And so this is the topic that we will um, talk about today. It's one of my favorite topics in machine learning. Literally. And I, and I, you know, I'm a, I, I've, I've worked a lot on natural language processing, but reinforcement learning is a really interesting uh, topic, very powerful. And then finally, the third classification, which I, I, I'm sure you guys remember, I've said this quite a bit, it's gonna be neural networks, right? But we will not start that topic until after spring break. That's the last topic for the semester. Okay, and we're gonna go from, from neural networks. There's actually, who was it? Actually, there's a really nice video. Uh, there's a lot of great videos actually about this. And I'll give you guys the history. This is almost like one of those things where I'm a history teacher also. Like I don't teach any history, but I definitely teach this history because it's really nice. Um, I, I will do this um, on, um, on after spring break. There's actually a lesson in life about uh, perseverance. And this is very interesting. It's a very compelling story. Uh, so I'll start with that actually uh, after spring break, the history of kind of neural networks. And, uh, but there's a video I just saw recently and I highly recommend that you check it out before, you know, when you have a break, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's on YouTube. I don't know if you guys follow channels on YouTube, but there's a, there's a guy, his name is Ver, Ver, he's got a channel, Veritasium. You've heard of it? Okay, great. So Veritasium, check it out. It's a V, so it's, it's probably spelled Veritasium, I want to say. Yeah, so check it out on YouTube when you have a chance. And he, he's, uh, he's a physicist who does a lot of like, he's very interested in also like uh, creating content videos and stuff. Educational, kind of like what the Discovery Channel used to be back in the day. Um, and so he's pretty good. He's a, he's very, uh, uh, has a very strong following on YouTube and he's, and he does a lot of things like physics. He'll, he'll explain things about physics, but for whatever reason, he became interested recently in computers in, in, uh, not that he's like starting in computers, just the top, that specific topic. And so he, he's got a series of videos. He's put out two videos right now. I strongly recommend that you check them out. Okay. Uh, they're called, uh, they're on the analog, uh, analog computers. Okay, so, so check them out. I should probably bring it up here. Um, so, Veritas, yeah, Veritas. 
this guy here. Um, and he's got, yeah, we're, I think it's this video actually. It's the most recent one, but I think this is one of two of the series. Uh, we're building computers wrong. So basically he's talking about how we use digital computers, right? Zeros and ones, you guys know that. But you could build analog computers. They're different. You know, they're just, and these analog computers would be, um, might be better for machine learning. You know, so certainly uh, check out his first video explains what an analog computer is. That's not so relevant to this course, but it, it'll, it'll help you. I don't think the videos are very long. They're like 20 minutes. They're very entertaining. The second video though, it's the one that I think is high. I, I, I like it. Uh, we're building computers wrong. I think it's this one because he goes into the history. Actually, interestingly enough, he goes into the history of, of machine learning, right? And he will, he, you know, it's very good. So, uh, I, you know, we'll start, especially neural networks, which is the topic that we're going to be starting after spring break. So I, 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 when I saw this, I was, you know, I was very intrigued by it. And I really liked what he did. And certainly he explains a lot of things very clearly, but also from the history point of view. Of neural nets. So I'll do it also, but you know, he, he's got graphics. So definitely check it out if you have time. Anyway, so as I was saying, uh, we will talk about neural networks and I'll go over the history and then we'll go, you know, all the way from the perceptron historically, which is, you know, the very fascinating uh, trying to create a neuron in a computer, right? Just one neuron. And from that idea, and then how things that happen in AI, Marvin Minsky and, and his team, and how they kind of hurt uh, that field for a while. And then um, I, until you arrive at where we are today, which is deep learning, right? Which is amazing stuff, actually. Uh, very, very, uh, at least it's, it's a, I'm always concerned about this, what's happening right now. So uh, machine learning AI, you can argue started around the forties, you know, like actually things that you implement, not the math of it, the math obviously, the Euclidean distance has existed for centuries, but the, the implementation of it started in the forties, you know, uh, Bell Labs, that, that, but during the time there's been a lot of winters what are called the AI winters. And those are periods of time that have lasted a decade, like the, I think the 90s and the late 70s, and part of the 80s, you know, where it's like it died down. So you guys are living in a tremendous time because I've never seen it like this. And, and so maybe, many, maybe some of you want to be data science. But I'm, I'm also concerned that, you know, we're going to hit a roadblock at some point and then we start another winter. But it doesn't seem like it. I don't know. But anyway, watch the video. You'll understand what I'm talking about. It'll, it'll be very, very enlightening. And then we can talk about it maybe when we come back after spring break um, and, and we discuss this. We, we will go as far as TensorFlow. And in particular, uh, something called Keras. So I'll, I'll you know, by the, by, by the end of that, you'll know the state of the art of how to implement uh, you know, deep learning on, on, on problems. Not all the algorithms, because that's a bigger class. Anyway, so, you know, as you can see, I, I really enjoy this, talking about this. Um, so we have three, three ways in which I've divided the class. Roughly speaking, we will have about four weeks to wrap this up. That should be enough time to cover all the algorithms, right? Um, actually, by the time we get to Keras, what's so funny about, about the story of neural nets, right, is that, you might think deep learning, ooh, we haven't gotten to deep learning, we haven't. But you tell the story of neural nets, perceptrons and everything, by the time you get to deep learning, you already know. You know what I mean? It's almost like, ah, that's it. You know, it's kind of like that. So you'll see, you'll see what I mean. It, there's, it's like a lot of building up to something that's kind of like, oh, that's it. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, so that's, um, that's the plan for the semester. As you can see, I'm in this section still, but at the, at the end, right? Uh, wrapping up these ideas where reinforcement learning is not necessarily 
probabilistic, but it's a very interesting topic. Okay, so let, let's go to the, the website. I think I have some documents there, not there on Brightspace. So let's go here. Let me share the documents. All right, so if we look at this, we are at reinforcement learning. Okay, so I guess the files are on Brightspace. So this is our, as I said, we start neural nets here, a bit of history, perceptron, and then here we're wrapping up reinforcement learning. We will look at some code um, with TaxiCab. TaxiCab is, is an example of, of, of using reinforcement learning. So I should say reinforcement learning has been used extensively for games. Right, so we're so we're gonna you're gonna be looking at it from the point of view of games. The idea is if you've ever played you know, uh, checkers, right, or chess or something, it's basically you play, right? You play against a computer. Well, that's basically what this. Is. So so I'll talk about how reinforcement learning learns and everything. So let's go actually to right space. I have some files there. Okay, so we're gonna go here. All right, so in content, you can see uh, this is, you know, we finished hidden mark of models and now we are at reinforcement learning. Taxi cab. So I have a few documents here uh, that you can uh, take a look at. So basically, there's this document. This is what I'm going to talk about today. So that's there for your reference. There's the code, of course, on GitHub. Um, we'll play with that. And then there's, I have this chapter basically here. So you'll have to read this. Okay. So not all of it, right? So you have to look for chapter nine. And there it is. So a reinforcement learning. Okay, so this chapter is a, a pretty good. Um, so you know it's clear enough, I think. So we'll go over this today. The best way to understand reinforcement learning is a game. Okay, so we'll think about a game, and then we'll you know this is kind of what I was talking about. This table kind of sort of represents this probability. So that's why this is put together in this area. Okay, and then there's you know explanation of some of the code, um, and then you know its connection to neural networks. Okay, so neural nets can actually be. So reinforcement learning was actually not neural networks. Reinforcement learning was its own thing. It's like its own strategy of teaching, of learning, uh, of teaching machines. And then when the kind of the revolution of neural networks came up in 2012 or so. Obviously, immediately people started thinking about how to apply uh, neural nets to reinforcement learning. And then things like deep reinforcement learning uh, were born. There was an algorithm called Q learning, um, and that became deep Q learning. So that's kind of how it works, right? So, um, but we'll, we'll explore this idea. And then you know, there's a lot of code. So I actually, I want to motivate this with uh, the work of a student of mine. Actually, he was a grad student here, uh, completed his master's thesis. Very brilliant uh, student, did an excellent job. And he built, um, so where do I need to go? He built a little project called Qplane. You can see that there. 
So if you look, Q plane, he's got a nice paper that you can read through, right? Uh, Q plane, an open source reinforcement learning toolkit for autonomous system aircraft simulation. All right, so the idea here is that he built a toolkit that allows him to integrate reinforcement learning algorithms to simulation uh, software. So for instance, how many of you have ever played um, Microsoft Flight Simulator? All right, there we go. So there's another one. During the, the decade where Microsoft Simulator was kind of out, there was X-Plane 11. So I don't know if you've ever heard of it. X-Plane 11 was the, like the European version. And that dominated actually up until like a couple of years when Microsoft decided to get back into that field. So David, his name is David, he built uh, this tool to integrate with X-Plane 11, but it actually also integrates to something else called JSB Sim and really anything. I mean, literally, technically, it could integrate with, you know, an RC plane, right? So you, know, you, you could, obviously it's gonna need some tweaking, but um, he could integrate with that. So he did a really good job. And basically the idea is that, you know, you, can, you communicate with the game via the network, right? So how do you, how do, you do that? you send UDP packets. That's all you guys understand networking pretty well. So you know you've got some kind of a game server you know, with a port open kind of waiting in the background. And then in the Python scripts, because this is written in Python, um, as you're interacting with the game to send it commands, you send it packets, you receive packets. And that's basically it. So think of it as an algorithm that's doing things, but now it can send network packets on the same computer to the server that's running the simulator and then you interact with the game. Does that make sense? So that's basically how it works. So that's kind of like a human, a human flying an airplane, right? They're gonna use the controls and, and do various things, right? They're gonna move the controls uh, up and down. Uh, in the simulator, of course, you send commands of the pressures, you know, the values of how you're gonna shift things. And you could do that randomly easily, but obviously the, the plane or the vehicle is gonna, the autonomous vehicle is gonna crash. Keep in mind, although he, he worked on this for uh, flight, you know, autonomous vehicles of any kind would fall into this as well, right? Because it's a vehicle moving through some, you know, whether it's flying in the air or, or being driven on the ground. So this applies to autonomous vehicles of any kind. And so the idea, as I said, is you could randomly move things around or you could, um, have some scheme, right? Be, be intelligent in how you do your movement. But then you need, to, you need to understand how to control the aircraft, so you need to learn. You guys see that? So that's the idea. So David, um, let's see, I've got, this is the model that he trained. That's the code. He's got some videos, I think. Yeah, so this is his video. You can see it here. I don't know if you can see it. But yeah, so you can see this is uh, JSB Sim. So one of the simulators, not, not X-Plane 11, but just the other one. He's got the code obviously running in the background here. And then this is the aircraft in the air. So uh, this is probably when it's learning, you know, and, and really the only problem that we studied, we have to limit the, you can see how it pitches down and up. So it's, it's learning right now. Um, but you have to, um, what was I saying? So anyway, so you, you, you create the, the code here to interact with the game basically. And, uh, oh yeah, I remember. So um, you have to select a task that you wanna learn. You can't just say, oh, you know, go figure out the world, right? You know, figure out how to do everything. Um, no, you, you have to learn specific tasks. So the specific task that we taught it, uh, that we wanted it to learn was to stabilize itself. And obviously the most important one, right? At the beginning. So it doesn't know how to land. It doesn't know how to take off. It doesn't know how to go from A to B, but those could be additional tasks to study in another piece of work. And so right now, the only thing that it was learning to do is to stabilize it. And it does, and it works, 
right? We got to the point where we could grab a, you know, like a joystick, right? And connect it to the game and just, you know, do something like that, put it the aircraft in a very bad attitude. When you let go of the joystick, you turn off the agent, it crashes, right? So eventually, right? Obviously it's gonna fly a little bit. But, but that's basically the idea. One, one key thing he did is he used um, JSB SIM, which is something that he can step down the physics so that he can train faster, right? So in X-Plane 11, the way that we did it, we couldn't really um, step down the physics. So it meant that we had to um, wait, you know, like in real time, it's basically like in real time, but that takes a long time to train. Whereas in JSB SIM, you can turn off the physics. And so it just, it, it learns faster. One thing with these reinforcement learning algorithms is they need a lot of time to learn something, right? So that's one thing. I believe there's, um, historically, the history of this is really nice also. There's, <laughs> apparently today I've watched a lot of TV because <laughs> here's another one. Uh, there's a there's I think on Netflix or is it YouTube I don't know there's something called AlphaGo is it AlphaGo do you know if it's on Netflix yeah yeah so maybe for free if you want to check it out also if you're bored um, it's a 50 minute you know kind of documentary AlphaGo and it's about this the the reinforcement learning things a lot of this has been done to games. Okay, so reinforcement learning has been applied mostly to games, as you can see here. Um, and it started with board games. So we today, uh, we'll, we'll do a board game, right? Taxi Cab is a board game. Uh, the, the one in the book is actually a board game called Frozen Lake, the easiest game you can think of. <laughs> um, Claude Shannon, actually, funny enough, Claude Shannon, uh, who's the father of information theory, you know, your whole major, Shannon, uh, he uh, in the 50s with relays and mechanical things built a, 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 a maze for a mouse. And the mouse had magnet, it was a magnet basically, but the mouse would learn how to find the cheese. Not a real mouse, but, and it was a game, a type of a board game. And it was all physical, you can check it out. It's, in a, it's probably in the Smithsonian or something, right? So what, what he did then. That's kind of the history now. It's more, you know, obviously digital. You can see this, the graphics are much better on this one. This is X-Plane 11. And it's the same thing. So actually one thing that, um, so anyway, as I was saying, a lot of the games are board games because it's base, you know, basic stuff. This is obviously a little bit more advanced, but actually simple enough. Um, one thing that David did that was really interesting is that he would train in JSB Sim, a totally different game, right? The task of flying. And then that learned model was applied in X-Plane 11 and it knew how to fly. So he did that really, that, a great, great job because it generalized really well. What a great thing, right? To train in a simulator, put it in another one. The next step is to put it in the real world and hopefully you don't have to tweak it that much and it'll do it. All right, so anyway, so you can see here, the plane is pretty stable. At this point, this is the testing phase that, you know, you know David, train and, and you can see the model. I mean, that's a very smooth ride, right? That's like an airline smooth, you know? So uh, that's pretty good. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of the motivation. I, I like to show this video, kind of show you guys how it works. So it can be as, it, it, it's not just board games, right? It can be as complex as you want. Um, you know, Tesla, you guys have all heard of Tesla. Tesla uses a lot of tools. But one of them is reinforcement learning. Okay, so um, anyway, so that's kind of the idea. So we'll we'll come back to this when we start looking at the algorithm in, specifically. But let's just go back to the whiteboard. Oh, and I was saying about AlphaGo. So AlphaGo, that documentary is basically, you know, there's been several board games, chess and everything, right? And chess was, um, uh, they beat the, the world champ many years ago, but it was purely heuristic, a, a tree and everything. It wasn't reinforcement learning. AlphaGo, which is supposed, I've never played AlphaGo, but it's supposed to be much more complex than chess. And uh, I think it was Google or someone 
they de yeah they develop um, AlphaGo. It's a reinforcement learning uh, technique. Also uses image processing. Um, and I think Google trained it for like 38 days straight with all their computing power. Think about how much computing power they have. And for 38 days, I think it was nonstop. And when they took it to play the world champ of AlphaGo, uh, they beat him. Right? They beat the master. So it, it re revolutionized everything. And that was that was like a like a moment in history. I mean that literally that event was published in a paper called uh, I think it was the Journal of um, Nature, which is you know if they discover aliens or you know that's that's where they publish right. So it's discoveries. So it was a pretty big thing, and since then it's been really interesting because reinforcement learning. It's, it's amazing how it learns, right? So, so that's actually what we're going to learn now. So, you know, I usually like to do a lot of like motivation here, you know, of, of, of this. So now let's go ahead and uh, think about reinforcement learning a little bit more. So I mentioned the history. Um, so in the past for games, everything was ruled. Everything was ruled based. So learning, or machine learning for games, let's say, was rules-based. You know, classic examples of this are, you know, IBM's Deep Blue uh, that played Jeopardy or, or when they beat the world champs of chess. But, you know, after around, now, let's just say probably there's a few developments before AlphaGo, I'm sure, but let's let's go, let's start here. AlphaGo, I think it was like 2014. I don't remember exactly. It this is no longer rules based. Okay. This is not a whole bunch of people just thinking up a whole bunch of heuristic rules. And this is the game learns by itself. Okay. So the game learns. On its own, and this is what we what we have to understand here is how does this work? It's actually very interesting. Okay, um, so I've talked so really, you know, they said probably one of the first things about this is Claude Shannon himself in the fifties. Nineteen fifties, and Claude Shannon. All right, and then a, a lot of the amazing things have happened really in the last decade or so, right? To we're in twenty twenty two now, right? And this is where reinforcement learning, with the help of deep learning, has really become extremely powerful. Okay, and it's a combination of both techniques. Um. So we've had AlphaGo, you know, AlphaGo and AlphaZero, right? And basically the idea that you wanna build models, RL models. So let's say RL model, the first one, AlphaGo, just learn how to play Go, the game of Go. That's all it played. But then came Alpha Zero. And, al and these are just algorithms. And Alpha Zero, the difference is that they didn't, want it, they didn't want it Alpha Zero to just play Go. They actually wanted it to play several games with the same architecture. That's really important. So it's not like you're building a model for every game. You build one model. And that model plays several games. First, it doesn't know them, but it learns. And then when it, once it learns how to play several games, it's really good at all games. And it defeats everyone. So this might be Go, chess, you know, and, and Shoji, I, Shogi, I've, I've heard of something called Shogi. It's like Japanese chess, I think, something like that. 
So um, why? Why not just make models for every game? Why make a model that is that can learn multiple games and play really well? Efficiency. Do you know any other efficient machine or example of anything in the world that can learn several games and play them really well? You, right? Humans, exactly. And so that takes us to this idea in AI that when you're, when you're saying how good something is, you actually want to think about what is the definition of, of AI? Right? So what's, the, what's the definition? What, what is AI, right? What is, and so actually, they've come up with a very simple equation or, or intuition of, of a good AI. And a good AI is a model, let's say, that, it, that is really good at multiple tasks that can learn multiple tasks and perform really well on multiple tasks. You, you guys see that? So it's basically this, this idea, right? That so it's, it's basically, it's defined almost as a sum, right? As, as a sum of the model being applied to N tasks, right? So you, you basically have this idea that, and this should be all. you have this idea that you're gonna sum the performance of all of these. You usually multiply this times, let's call it a weight. And that weight is gonna, it's, it's called the complexity weight, which basically quite simply says how complex the game is or the task, I should say the task. But we can model anything as a game. Right? That's, what, what, that's what you used to do when you were little. You know, you got a chore and you were told, you know, Go, you know, go pick up those clothes, but then you make it fun like a game and then it's an entertaining thing. So, so that's the idea. So actually the definition of AI, the working definition nowadays is that, yeah, a, a model that does really well on one specific task, that's great enough. But a more intelligent model is one that can perform multiple tasks, that can learn multiple tasks and the, and the one that does the best job is the most intelligent. Okay, and so so that's kind of the idea, and you do, you do want to take into account the complexity of the game, the task. A task that's easy is not the same as a task that's really hard, right? So um, obviously, uh, the people that solve the more complex tasks, you know, they're called geniuses, right? So and that's kind of the, the idea here. So anyway, this is pretty pretty interesting. So uh, this has been the evolution. So from AlphaGo to Alpha Zero. A lot of machine learning AI is around this nowadays. So everything is going in that direction. I remember the time when people used to say, no, 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 you're, you're, you need to be specific to your problem. Your data has to be specific, 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 or you're not going to get any. We are at a stage now in the world where we're past that. And now true, the best methods are the methods that are considered the best are the ones that generalize really well for multiple tasks, okay? And this is true in reinforcement learning as it is true in other fields, okay? And as you can see, this is all being applied, not just in games, but, you know, self-driving cars, uh, Boston Dynamics, they have, you know, that uh, spot, that dog and, and, and uh, many industries are looking at. All right, so now the next, so we've talked a little bit about the history. Now, the next thing we're gonna talk about, so what is this reinforcement learning? What is reinforcement learning? Well, to understand it, let's think about what we've been doing all semester, supervised learning. Right? So to learn a model in supervised learning, what do we need? What do we need? Let's say we have an algorithm like Naibase or KNN or, or a neural net, whatever it is. What do we need to teach 
that model to do its task. X and Y, perfect answer. So we need X and Y. X and Y. So we need some features F1, F2, F3, F4, right? Some values here and the associated label. Zero, 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 one, one, one. Right? We need the classes, right? And that's how we've been learning. Reinforcement learning does not work like that. In reinforcement learning, you actually do not need X and Y. You don't need data. What you need is an environment in which you can interact. That's why the games, the simulator, that's actually why I started with the simulator, right? Or, you know, if we start playing a game like chess, right? Let's say. So you have a model, however it is, let's think of it as a black box of reinforcement learning. And we just need to define what this black box is gonna do in relation to the environment. You see that in relation to the environment. So the environment uh, needs to provide some feedback to the model. So the model, you know, let's say there's gonna be an environment and that becomes extremely important. And then we have what is called an agent. So that's reinforcement learning right there. It's a game. What does the agent do? The agent takes actions in the environment. And then what does the environment do when the agent takes actions? It provides a status of the current state. So we're going to have current state, or we're going to have state before an action and state after an action. And this is going to be repeated, right? So we're going to have an iterative. So basically the environment is defined by states. You see that? We have the state of the environment. Does the agent know the state of the environment? Sure. You're playing the game. When you're playing the game, you look at the board, correct? You're not gonna make a move at random. You look at your board. Based on the board, you take you know, a specific move. So then given the state, the agent takes an action. You see that? That action then, what, what happens in the, in, in, with, when the action is taken by the agent is the state is going to change. So the state changes, and then now the environment will send back the new state. And then with that new state, the agent will take a new action and so on. You guys see that? What it needs to learn is a mapping. So in the most basic function, of reinforcement learning, it will need to learn a mapping between states and actions. So let's think about this. You have an initial table. This table, and in the most basic form of Q learning, oh, sorry, of re reinforcement learning, uh, this algorithm is called Q learning. And basically, the idea is that you need to define states, which are gonna be the rows. You need to define states, and then you need to define actions. You guys see that? And so let's just say for now, the actions are A, B, C, and D, whatever they are, right? And then you have specific states. So if I'm in state, three, which action should I take? Now, of course, you need to limit the number of actions that you're gonna take. Now in, 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 our, in the real world, right? Like for us humans, right? We can take many, many actions. You know, I can do whatever right now. But if you're driving and you have a truck over here, probably doing this is not a good idea, right? So you, you're limited by the, what you've learned, you know, you have a vehicle, a, you know, an 18 wheeler going really fast on the interstate to your left, probably go right, right? And so, so that's the idea. So S3 represents, for instance, a big truck to your left. If this is right, this should have a very low value of taking an action. Probably staying in your lane should have, you know, the, mo the highest, uh, Turning right may also be, you know, depending on other circumstances, but that's the idea. So the idea is that you have states and actions. 
And initially, these can be set at random. So these are just random values. So you actually don't know what to do. So really, when, you're, when, you, when you do reinforcement learning, you have this initially in the beginning, you have a phase called the exploration phase, okay? So the exploration phase is the initial air, uh, part of the, mod, of the learning process where you just take values randomly, okay? And given those, you know, given the actions that you take randomly, you end up in strange states. Now a game has rules, right? That's the key thing. A game has rules. And based on the rules, you're gonna be told, you know, something about your, your action. Do you guys see that? Now these rules of the game, let's call it game rules, are the thing that replaces, replaces X and Y. Right, so in supervised learning, we were learning from X and Y, right? You know, the features and, and the classes, that's what we learned from. We, don't, we no longer have that in reinforcement learning. So we need a way to learn. And the way to learn, this is just a mechanism of your, you take an action, you end up in a state, right? You take another action, you end up in another state. But we need to have a way to know, okay, that that action that I take, is it a good one or a bad one? And that is to say, all these values, let's say, are initially 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. But eventually, as you start learning, might turn out that this one becomes 0 0.7, and all of these become very small, close to 0. So you really know this is really the action. So when you, when you arrive at this stage, you're basically done with the Q learning, and you've trained the model. So your model is now trained, it, it, it understands. You guys see that? Is this making sense? Yeah. The Q learning is the algorithm itself that is applied or used to learn. So the training phase, I would say, uses Q learning to learn. You see that? We'll, we'll look at the algorithm in a second. It's in that chapter. But right now I'm just giving you the intuition, right? So we have this agent, it plays in the environment. This is just code, right? So this is just Python code. You have a thing called environment, you have a thing called agent, and you have a for loop. Every time that you take an iteration in the for loop, you update the states, right? And eventually you're, you have an objective, right? And that objective is, that is uh, based on the game rules. This is something, this is probably the hardest part of reinforcement learning, is that you have to take these game rules and define them for your environment. And every environment is gonna be a little bit different, right? So what needs to happen is you need, first of all, a way of updating these values, right? So that this value, let's say that when you're in state S3, it turns out that the best action to take is B. So you need to have, some kind of a function that will update these to go down and this one to go up, right? That is called the Bellman equation. Actually, That's called the Bellman equation. And that is for updating. So it's for updating the, um, the values in the Q table itself. So, so this is the, the basic idea. However, as part of the game rules, you need to also know several things. You have one objective, which is to win, right? You want to win the game. You play chess, you want to, for the purpose of winning the game, you play checkers for the purpose of winning the game. Alpha go, you want to win the game. Or in the, in the example of, of stabilizing the plane, for instance, you want the, the differences in the movements to be very small, right? So if, if the states should be zero, 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 right? In the angles, you want to be as close to that as possible. You guys see that? So that's the objective. So you, but you need, so you need some criteria, right? To win, okay? And then you also need some criteria to tell you if you're doing well or bad, right? And that is usually called the reward function. So you need something called the reward function.
Okay, and the reward function is basically a function that returns a value. And you're gonna be using that value every time. So every time that you take an action, the environment actually returns the reward and the new state. So if this was state T, then this is state T plus one. Do you guys see that? And then you know the action that you took because you sent that action back, right? You're gonna use the reward and the new state T plus one to determine, okay, I need to update these values first of all, and then hopefully over time, you will, the rewards will start to go up. So that's the other thing. How do you measure performance? In, in supervised learning, to measure performance, we use what? Precision, recall, F1 measure, right? You, you guys from accuracy? The confusion matrix, right? You remember those metrics. In reinforcement learning, you no longer use those. And now you, one of the ways that you can measure is by your objective or by the rewards. So what, what that means is that, how do you know that your reinforcement learning algorithm is doing well? Well, this is time, right? So you're playing a game and you're gonna say, I'm gonna play 100,000 epics of the game. That's like saying, I'm gonna play 100,000 chess games. Each one's a new one from start. But within each epic, I'm going to play a thousand moves. That might be too much for chess. Let's say a hundred moves. So a hundred moves. And then after that, the game ends. And so how do you measure performance? Well, over time, you accumulate rewards. So rewards are, you know, are variable, right? So if, Actually, the rewards can be negative, which are penalties, right? They actually take away. Or rewards can be positive. And what that means is that, um, and they can be really high. If you're doing really well, like in chess, you kill the queen or something, right? So that, that should probably have a high reward. And so the rewards go up. So what should happen is that over time, that should happen. You guys see that this is how you measure performance in reinforcement learning. Okay. Another way, for instance, actually, uh, my student David, um, he was measuring uh, performance by looking at, for instance, pitch is the angle of the plane. Pitch. So if the plane is like this, you know, in, in, in relation to a horizon or an angle, it's pretty good. But if the plane starts to do this, that's probably not good. If the plane starts to do this, that's probably not good. And the angle is much bigger, right? Whereas here, the angle is smaller. So he basically said, if the angle is zero, so initially the value is like this, but eventually I want the value to do this. You see that? To, to be get close to zero, the goal. So that's another way of measuring performance, right? So something like that, specific to the task or just in general, uh, accumulate the rewards over time. You guys see this? Is this making sense? Any questions about it? All right, so, so that's the idea then. So we know how to measure performance by accumulating rewards over time. And we know that we have this idea that we have a table where we're accumulating values given a state. We have uh, the reward, uh, sorry, the actions that we want to take. And then we've got this kind of loop going on where we have something called an environment and we have the agent and it's a, they're basically interacting with each other. So the agent takes action at state T, the environment then based on the game rules will provide a reward uh, that has to be defined and it's specific to the problem. And also it provides uh, the new state. And so now given the new state, you're gonna decide, well, now the new state is S7, okay, so I'm gonna look at the actions for S7 and, um, and do this. But let's say that you're in the random phase. And so you really don't, these values are not reliable. So then you're gonna take a, you're gonna pick one randomly. And let's say this seems to be the highest, but you actually pick this one, right? Just randomly, you set that at, when I'm in state seven, I'm gonna take action C randomly. So how do you know that that was a good one? Well, because you're gonna send that action into the environment, the environment will send you a reward. 
So actually this was the better action. So this would have gotten the higher reward based on the game rules. So you get a lower reward. And so that means that when you update all of these, this will not update very well. So this will still stay around 0 0.01. Whereas if you had chosen this one, the reward would be high. And so this would start to go up. Eventually, as you've learned, you know, you end up with something like this, where you have one very clear uh, value for the actions that you would take. You guys see that? That's basically it. I mean, the, in, the, in its simplest form, the Q learning algorithm works exactly like this. I mean, there's more to it. Obviously, the Bellman equation is something we can talk about, but this is how reinforcement learning works. You guys see that? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. One at a time, yes. Yeah. So, it, so it would be for the given S3, these actions. Yes. You're going to look at that particular, because that's what you took and you update that. So you have to do all states. And you're probably thinking that's a lot of work. That's why it took 38 days uh, to update something. Neural nets, what they do is instead of having this Q table, you actually learn a function where the function returns these values given the states, but it's no longer a table, it is going to be a neural network. So the way that you can think about it for now is just think of it as a function that returns actions given states. But instead of you crafting the table like this, you actually have a function. This will become more obvious once we start looking at how neural networks work, but for now, it's, it's good enough to just think of it. We replaced a table with a function. What goes on in that function? Well, that's neural networks. But the relationship is still the same. Given a state, get a match. Got it? Any other questions? All right, so this is the overall intuition, the big picture, if you will. So let's now go into the, the document, the Word document. Let's go PDF here. So this is reinforcement learning. Now, one thing I want to say is that reinforcement learning, if you understood what I just said, you know, it should be very interesting because I'm basically saying that as long as you can model anything as a game, you can solve it with reinforcement learning. And that's pretty significant, actually, because let give me a, a think of a problem that you think is really difficult. Just give me a yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly, right. So learning how to drive. So obviously, you're not gonna put a Q learning algorithm in a car in a Tesla and send it out in the road, especially because you know at the beginning it's doing things random. But you create a simulator. As long as you capture some of the logic, the physics of that, you can train that model. And then eventually you could expect it to do well. So any problem, really, not just that, but any problem, as long as you can find a way to set it as a game, where a game is really you have goals, right? You have an environment, you have something interacting with it, getting a little bit of feedback based on the rules, and then it can learn. You see, so, so that's the power of this uh, tool. Now, creating an environment and giving it the rules is challenging, but if you can do it successfully, um, you don't need training data. Not at all, right? So it, it, it can train for years, right? It can train for years and eventually learn, right? Uh, if, if, you, if, you put it, if you code in the rules correctly. So reinforcement learning, as I said, um, it's an area of machine learning. You could say between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. 
Um, it has been used extensively. One of the most important papers is this one from 2015, where they applied it actually to 49 Atari games, which are you know a step above like board games, right? Atari games. When they apply it to Atari games, you actually use images. You take a picture of the you know you can imagine an Atari. You guys, did you guys ever? You play Atari, okay. yeah, like Space Invaders or something, right? So you take a picture of it, and that image can be used as an input to this, right? It's a grid. It's a grid of pixels. It's not that big, and then you know the the model will learn, right? You know what what to do over time. So the main advantage of applying reinforcement learning to games is that games are governed by rules. Uh, so you have game states, the inputs and actions, the outputs that lead to new states and, as I said, rewards, which are the objective to maximize. So therefore you don't need labels or anything like that. Now I should say there's a very nice, um, we'll, we'll use this actually. There's a Python library called OpenAI Gym. And OpenAI Gym has a lot of games. Uh, there's, a, there's one probably now for Atari to, um, and for 3D things, but OpenAI GM is mostly board games, right? And um, it's a nice library so that you can apply your reinforcement learning algorithms to these board games. So you don't have to actually create the rewards or the rules of the game. That's already defined. The environment basically is already defined. And then you are just using, um, are just using the agent to interact with the game. Okay, uh, I will start kind of just discussing Frozen Lake. Frozen Lake is one of the games in uh, OpenAI Gym, and it's pretty straightforward. So you can see here, here's Frozen Lake, but it'll give us uh, some, some, some things that we can use to kind of define parameters. Hmm? But you recognize it now? Yeah. Yep. So Fro Frozen Lake is a game about crossing a frozen lake that has some cracks in the ice with holes. And there's wind sometimes that pushes the person crossing it. Uh, the game is very simple and consists of a grid that is four by four, like so. Right. So you can see that here. So basically, I think I can annotate that. So you start here, right? And you know, basically if there's like a mouse, so the mouse basically has a couple of actions, right? It can go up or forward, or it can go to the left. It could go right, but there's no nothing there or back. So these are the states, right? The states just mean where the mouse could be at all times, right? Because this is four by four, we have 16 options basically. Right, so four by four is 16. So we, we really have states equal to 16. What that means is, you know, we're here, that's one state, or we're here, that's another state, or we're here, that's another state. So we always know where we are in relation to the game. So as the mouse starts to go, maybe the first thing it does is goes there and it falls in a hole. And so that's bad right so it fell so you lose the game but eventually the point would be to go here 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 there and then you win the game you see that but if you deviate fall in the hole fall in a hole you know and so or you go in here fall in a hole Right, so, so the idea is that to find that optimal path and that optimal path is actually done through um, reinforcement learning. So the objective then is to, let me turn this on. So the objective here then 
is to get to the cheese without falling into a hole or being pushed by the wind into a hole. There are four mo moves. So these are the actions, right? So these are up, down, right, and left. So that already defines the things that you can do. You already know the actions that you can take. In fact, if you think about what my, my student did, uh, David, he actually just had also four. You know, it, it might seem more complex, right? With uh, an airplane, you would think, no, but how many actions? He actually just had four. He just needed pitch down, pitch up, roll left, roll right. That's it. That's all he, and because all he needed to know is, okay, do I do this? And by how much do I do this? And by how much do I do this? Which is the analogy of the car. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I hit the brake, right? So you really just have a few things. So it's actually just because you see the simulator as being a lot more complex doesn't mean that the action space is going to increase dramatically. Okay. You can get a lot just by simplifying things. But here in Frozen Lake, there are only uh, four moves, which are up, down, right, and left. And there's only one reward, and that is to get the cheese. However, you only get the reward in the future by first taking several steps on frozen blocks without falling in the hole. So one challenge is that you have to state your objective in terms of several future moves. And this is complicated, and this is accomplished, sorry, using something called the Bellman equation. So if you remember, you know, I said that to get the values of the reward function, you need something, right? Something to update those values. That is called the Bellman equation. It's very interesting how it works, but it considers that you're gonna be, you know, if you start a game now, you're not gonna win it at the first try, right? Or even at the first step, you have to advance in the, in the lake until you get to the cheese. So, but the Bellman equation is the, uh, is the thing, the, the thing that we have function that we can use do this calculation. So the key to predicting these rewards is to know the associated reward given a current state and an action. And this is called Q mapping. For such a simple, now it's, it's nice to start with Frozen Lake because Frozen Lake is small. And so it gives us a very clear idea of how to do things. So for such a simple grid, we just use a table. Some people call it a lookup table, et cetera. In this case, our table would be 16 by four. Remember I said, there, there's basically 16 possible positions that you can be in, right? So each one of those could be considered a state. So it's you know four by four, that's 16, and then there are four actions, okay? So for such a simple grid, we, we could just use a table. In this case, our table would be 16 by four. There are 16 possible states. Uh, which are the positions in the four by four grid, and there are four actions. Since we know the rules of the game and the layout of the grid, we can populate the table and learn the Q rewards for each state action pair. And this here's an example of it. So you can see up, down, left, right, and then states one to one to sixteen, where they just represent, you know, where you are. Okay, they just represent where you are in the in the frozen lake. So this is the Q table. And you can see, I just have some random values here, but ultimately you would want these values to be updated, you know, after training to be correct. That if you're in state one, you know for sure you're, you go down. You see that? So here is the reward function. So uh, now the main challenge is that we need to learn future rewards for future actions as we move through the grid. So we need some way of updating and, and updating those values. So here the Bell, Bellman equation will help. And we can think of, of this should say, of, think of the Bellman equation as a type of recursive function that looks at the future state given the current state. But you know, it's basically pretty simple actually. To update, one entry, right? One state action pair. Let's say that we want to update, you know, one value here, this one, 0.6, right? Or something. So we look at the specific index for state and action. We look at its current value there, right? We look at its current value there. And then we're going to try to 
figure out, we have the state, the current state, we take an action and then we get the new state. You see that? So this is basically what happened here. If I go back to the whiteboard, remember the agent takes an action. It's in a current state, state T, but when we take that action in the environment, the state changes, right? So now you are in state T plus one and you also get a reward, right? And so that's basically what's gonna happen here is that you need to figure out what the reward is for that new state, okay? And so that's the, that's the algorithm. In the algorithm, we take the current reward, right? Whatever's in the table there already. So basically this value is this value. But then we also take what will be the future reward. So that means we know that we were in state T, we took action, now we are in state T plus one. So this is state T plus one, future. All right, and so we, now here we have multiple actions that we would take because this is the whole vector of the future. And then we're just gonna select the maximum value to take in the future. You guys see that? And that reward is, Add it to the original reward times a weight. And the weight just indicates how much we want to trust the future, if you will, right? So should you trust the future a lot or should you not trust it that much? You, you have to find a balance. So if we look at the table over here, that's almost like saying, well, I'm updating uh, this one. So I'm going to take state seven down 0. 0.6. I've got that value. That action given state seven puts me in state four. So now for state four, I'm gonna grab all of these four and I'm gonna select the maximum value, which is left, 0.1. And then given that, I'm gonna update the reward to know that when I take seven and I end up in four, then you know I'm gonna update with these two values. The current reward, plus the future reward uh, that I would take in the future. You guys see that? And you're kind of trusting that this eventually will be correct. Although initially, remember these are not correct, right? Because they're random, but that's the idea. So you're kind of, you don't have to look at all the, by the way, all the, all the states in the future. You just look at the current and the next. One. And that should be enough for you to infer uh, what's going on. So you update things kind of like that. So, uh, so now the main challenge is that we need to learn future rewards for future actions as we move through the grid. The Bellman equation will help us. Um, these values can be looked up from the table. Uh, so that, that's kind of so Q learning using a table. So let's let's take a look a little bit at how we would write this code basically. Uh, in this section, we'll discuss the how to implement Q learning. And this uses AI gen, okay, for that game. So we basically import NumPy, if we import Jim. If Jim may not be installed on your computers by default, so you'll have to install it. Probably pip install Jim would do it. So we need to create a variable called environment, which represents the game itself, frozen lake. And this object will represent the game and holds all the parameters related to states, actions, rewards, and current game state, which means have you lost or, or not. You can create a new environment just like this, right? Then we initialize uh, the table. The, Q uh, the table Q for all, with all zeros basically, and of size 16 by four. So you can say environment observation space is 16 and action space is four. And then we create a Q table. You can see that here, which is just numpy dot zeros and, or, or I should say uh, states by action, so 16 by four. 
Then we need a few additional parameters like the learning rate, et cetera, number of episodes. So these are the parameters that uh, we can play with. So we take 2000 epics or episodes and initialize some parameters, the learning rate, et cetera. Each episode represents a game played. So basically you're gonna say, I'm gonna play 2000 games and in each game, I'm gonna take 30 moves. You know, 30 moves just means 30 actions. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna action, 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 30. Uh, and so that, that's it. These lists are just to, to capture these. So we use J list and R list here to collect the number of steps taken per episode and the total rewards per episode respectively. And this helps us to kind of determine, you know, how, how well we did. Uh, the following code segment goes over the main loop of the key learning algorithm in the next code segment. So basically for I in range number of episodes, this controls playing uh, the game, right? So uh, number of episodes is the epics. So, and it indicates that we are playing 2000 games during uh, the learning phase. And believe it or not, this is it, right? This is the Q learning uh, code. Right. Simple as that. Um, if we did neural networks, that would change a little bit, but you know that um, I would talk after we talked about neural networks. So here is the algorithm for Q learning. So for I in range number of episodes, that's every ep every game, right? That we're going to play. Every time that we play a game, what do we do? The first thing. We reset the game, right? So environment.reset just returns the game back to the starting position in the grid, right? So sends you back to start. Okay, that's all it does. So, so it sets the state to whatever that is, state one, let's say. Then after that, we are all is the reward. So we just initialize it to zero because we're starting a new game. D false means that you win the game or not. So D is a control for determining if you've won the game or not. So obviously we just started it. So we haven't won it, it's not over. And then J is just the number of plays in each game. So like I said, how many actions are you gonna allow to take? So one, one iteration is one action. Okay, and we're gonna play 99 actions per game. Then uh, we start playing the game, okay? Uh, we, we need to know the, the action space here, which is four. That is to say how many actions uh, we can take. Then after that, we need to decide, okay, I'm in a, in a, I'm in a position now within the game, what's the first thing I need to do? I need to take an action. Now you know where you are because you're in state S, the starting position. The, every iteration, this state will need to be updated and you're gonna take an action. So if you notice, all that's happening is you take an action, given that action, you give it to the game. The game then returns the new state, a reward and whether or not you won the game. Given that information, you use the Bellman equation to update the values in the Q table. Then you have a counter of your, the rewards that you've received. Notice this is really important here. What, is, what do you think is happening in this line of code? What is happening there? Yes. Not exactly. Um, that the S one might be misleading, but the S one just means different from S. Actually, this is the current state. This is the new state. But once the new state becomes old, what does it become? Current state, right? Do you see that? So we start at S, 
We took an action and the game now ended up in S1, the new state. So what do we do to S? S becomes S1 because we're no longer in start. We're now, we've moved. So it's basically like I was here and I went left. So now the state is this one, no longer that one. That's what that S1 assigned to S means, that we're no longer here, we're here. We take another action, we go over here, what happens? That's the new state. So this was S, this is S1. So now S becomes S1, meaning that we are here at this point, this juncture. Got it? Is this clear for everyone? So if you can see, it's actually not very complex, right? Because we have, think about the logic, as I said, this is it. This is reinforcement learning. Play a game. We start a new game. Reset it. So go back to the starting position. Basically initialize all variables to zero or false. Now you're going to play 99 uh, moves. So what do you do? What's the first thing? These are all just like values. But the fir very first thing you need to do is A, pick an action. Once you've picked an action to take, send that action to the environment. The environment will use that action to update the reward, which basically tells you how well you did. And it also tells you what the new state is. That is to say where you ended up. Now. Given these values, you update the Q table. And then once you have done that, you just send, you just set current state to the new state. Got it? Okay, so now let's break it down a little, a little bit more. So how do we pick an action? So to pick an action, we would take whatever, this is Q, right? This is slicing, something that you practice in the beginning with NumPy, right? So you grab Q at S. So that means that you grab, let's say, Q1. You grab the whole thing, right? Because that, that's what it says. We grab the whole thing. State one, all of them, the four, the vector. That's why, that's why there's, there's a colon here. That means all four, right? And out of these four, we would basically just do argmax. And argmax would give us the index of the highest value. And that's it, right? That's the action. But then you might say, what is all of this here? All of that is a trick, tricky way or trick on how to randomize in the beginning. What this does is the values in the beginning um, are zero, they're small. And so you're just gonna, uh, you just need to add a little bit of randomness to those values. And whenever it picks something, it's gonna be different, right? Because it's randomly picked. But this is controlling. Notice that this depends on I, uh, which is the number of epochs. So as this I in the denominator starts to get really big, this value actually the randomness becomes very small so over time you're adding almost zero to the value so the the idea being that when you start the 2000 uh games or epics right in the beginning the the i is very small therefore this value is really high and so you're always picking a value but because of the random randomness you end up picking another action once you're past like 1,000 or, or a lot, the, these values are pretty big and these values are pretty small. So they're, they're not gonna make a difference anymore. And that's how we control random. Do you guys understand that? You know, so ba that's the basic idea. But at the end of the day, all we're doing here is actually out of the four possible actions for that given state, we pick the maximum. We then, once let's assume once we've learned the table, this you could basically disregard this. We just pick one, we send it to the environment. The environment has rewards. It tells you what state you end up in based on the rules of the game. And now you come in and you're gonna do the update here. And remember the update is update Q for the state and the action. So we just grab the same value in there already. But now we work in the reward that we got from the game. And it could be a penalty too, right? 
right? We get that value plus the future value. Okay, so that's the future value of Q at S1. So if you look at Q at S1, the next state, right, that we end up with, end up with after taking an action, we take the four values there and we just pick the one with the highest value. So it's, that's the whole idea that, you know, if we're at this state and we take this action and we end up at this other state, what would be the reward of the highest value? What would be the action we would take in the future as well? That's, that's just the Bellman equation and it works. And so we get the reward, the reward plus the future reward. Notice that that reward is multiplied times a W here. And what that W implies is, as I said, how much do you trust the future? You can make this zero and then obviously you don't trust it at all, right? You just go by the reward. But here the reward is actually being influenced by the future as well. You can totally disregard this. This is just like a normalization parameter to kind of minimize the, the values. And this is a learning rate, which means also how fast do you want these rewards to move, right? So if this is a small value, it's very small. Yeah. Not necessarily. You have to find an optimal point for this. That's usually how it works. Right. So it's not, um, it's, it's, you'll see this also with neural networks is learning, neural networks also have a, a, a learning rate, but it basically translates into that. How quickly do you want these values to update or how slowly? The f so if they, if, if that value is a lot, um, you're gonna have very big movement of the values from negative to positive, you know, or, you know, whereas if you have it very small, it's gonna be gradual. It takes longer, but it's a little bit more stable in the way it's being updated. Make sense? Uh, maybe. It is, <laughs> you have to try it. I mean, it's not set in stone. All right, and then this is the Bellman equation. So now the Q values are updated. Then you keep track of the rewards, just as I said, you can plot it, et cetera. You update the state. Here you check to see if you won the game because if you won the game, you know, no need to do more, you won the game, right? And, um, and that's it, that's basically it. And then everything else I've explained right here, or basically I, everything that, I just said is explained in detail. Okay, and that's basically Q learning. Now, Q learning using a neural network, that's basically taking the same framework, the same code here, but now we're gonna update it to where the Q table is dependent on a neural network, right? But that we haven't covered neural networks yet. So I'm, you know, we're not gonna cover that just yet. Okay, so you're basically responsible for reading up until here, right? You can skip the rest uh, because right now, um, I don't wanna get into this part if you haven't really, we haven't touched neural networks. Neural networks yet. So that'll be a topic of uh, after spring break. Yeah, and that's it. Um, any questions? You guys understand Q learning? You think so? We have a quiz right now. All right. Um, so the plan is for, I'll go over the code on. Wednesday. All right, so we'll go over uh, an example of something called Taxi Cab. Um, you can start reading through the code. It's already on GitHub if you'd like. Um, so it should be here. Yeah, so you can see here, this is uh, in, the, in the course website or GitHub. We have this Taxi Cab RL. And so we'll go over this on 
Wednesday, and we'll be able to kind of see the game is this is this won't be frozen like this is a little bit more of a complex game. You have it's still a board game, but now you have in this board game, you have position A, position B, you have a passenger, and you have a little block that represents the cab. The cab needs to learn how to pick up a passenger and take them to their destination, where the destination is designated area. So you pick somebody at a designated area and you take them to another area. And then there's going to be obstacles along the way. So the idea is how fast can it learn the, the optimal route, et cetera. But it's very simple. It's a board, board game type of a thing. So don't forget then, uh, we'll, we'll go over the, that code on Wednesday. And then we will also have a little bit of time for you to do your demos of your uh, recommender system. So make sure that you have that ready for uh, Wednesday. And then you'll submit the homework also on that day. OK? Yeah. There will be a submission link on Brightspace. So, so I think, let me, let me check, actually. Maybe I haven't created these yet. You, you can do that if you want. Put it on your own channel and just, you know. Um, I thought I created, yeah, here it is. Recommender system, uh, due March 9th, right? It's under the module. Uh, Recommender system, singular value decomposition. So it should be open and it'll stay open until Saturday. So you have until then, but you know, I would like you guys to demo uh, Wednesday and then we'll be done. As I said, if we go back to the, white, to the whiteboard, we will be done with distance metric types of problems and probabilistic types of problems. And all we will have left for to wrap up the semester is the neural, neural network. That's it. Any questions? All right, so I'll stop the recording now.